So appreciate everybody joining today. Uh, if you came in late, I'll just warn everybody, the dogs are gonna bark. There's gonna be great commotion because yesterday Carol said, oh, uh, I'm gonna use the self-cleaning feature of the oven. And uh, I said, sure, that should be okay. And the oven thought, had other thoughts. So the oven stopped working. And if you've tried to get a, appliances these days, you can realize, oh, if you wanna buy a oven now, you can expect to get it in January. So. We have the repair guy that fixed it the last time this happened and he's on his way over. And of course he is supposed to arrive during the time we're all to get together. So if uh, the dogs start barking, you see Carol jump up. If you see me grab my chest when I get the bill for it, it's because the oven guy is gonna be here. So appreciate everybody joining today. Uh, we're gonna be talking about, uh, as the uh, topic name suggests, the United States pavilions. It was interesting when we uh, did the talk last week on uh, Israel at the World's Fair, a number of people uh, mentioned how uh, they enjoyed seeing how one particular theme had changed in so many uh, venues over the years, uh, you know, for the, the various I Israel pavilions. So we're going to uh, do the same today with the United States pavilion, and I'm going to uh, try to talk a little bit about what made each of the pavilions uh, different, the exhibits, that sort of thing. Um, I'm going to start with 1933. Uh, obviously, the United States has had pavilions at other fairs beforehand, uh, but my collection basically starts with the 1933 Chicago World's Fair. And since I generally try to bring up pictures or things that you would uh, not find by just going to Google and you know put, popping in something, uh, I'm stop starting in 1933. So with no further ado, if you do have questions or anything, you can uh, throw them in chat. And uh, again, if Carol uh, sees them or if Don sees something in particular, they can uh, let me know. But let me share my screen here. And we're going to start with, uh, again, Sh Chicago 1933 World's Fair. This was a, a very interesting uh, pavilion uh, from the point of view of visibility. Uh, this whole thing was built across uh, a giant lagoon which was, this was all man-made uh, expansion of the uh, area into the lake, uh, which is out there today, uh, a, a park. But this particular uh, pavilion built by three architects, a fellow named Edward Bennett, uh, Hubert Burnham, and John Hollibird. Now the name Burnham is real familiar for people in Chicago because a different one, Daniel Burnham, had done an awful lot of the designing of the uh, uh, parks in that in Chicago. Uh, this particular uh, threesome got together and came up with this particular um, uh, design. And there's three towers on this. Uh, basically, you have uh, the legislative, judicial, and executive branches, each uh, done by, uh, uh, represented by one of the towers. And in the center, a giant 70-foot rotunda. Very striking building to uh, uh, catch the eye. And it was uh, like most other US pavilions, they ran into the issue of uh, two things. One is you need the money to build the pavilion, and then you need the money to actually put exhibits in it. But this was very popular because a lot of the US government uh, entities were all trying to tell everybody what they did. So the Department of Agriculture, the Department of the Navy, the Department of you know whatever, uh, they all found some money out of their budget to uh, participate in this uh, particular fair. Is another view of it. They put a stage in front, not a stage, a dock rather, a pier in front. Uh, the idea was that dignitaries would be able to come across the water by a boat into the uh, fair and uh, not have to hobnob with all the rest of us because, again, there was no uh, real access to this other than walkways, which were going to be thronged by people. Uh, a lot of the dignitaries decided they did not like coming out across the lake, particularly in a very windy day, so the dock didn't end up getting a, a lot of use. But it was a giant building. It was uh, 620 feet long and went back for 300 feet deep. So it had quite a few uh, exhibits inside. You can see the uh, Sky Ride Tower off to the, uh, the right there. Uh, again, this is looking all the way across the lagoon over towards it. Tallest thing over there other than the, uh, the Sky Ride, which obviously dwarfed it, but uh, very eye-catching. And that's one thing that we're going to be looking at some other pavilions over the years. In some cases, the designers are very smart to make sure that your eyes are drawn to it. And others, you'd have to say, so where is the United States Pavilion again? Could somebody please point it out to me because I just don't see it. Right next to it, they had the Court of States, which was a uh, uh, area for all the states that could exhibit. 
we were talking a week or two ago about Epcot, how the initial designs had the idea of everybody having the same amount of uh, front space, but different pavilions, and that's what they did here. So Ohio and uh, say California had the same amount of square footage at the front, but your building could go back all sorts of uh, distance or a, a, a different amount of acreage behind it. Another view of the rotunda up there, you can see they fluted the inside of the uh, uh, columns as they face the rotunda, and they were particularly good for catching the, the sun and the, uh, the light as the, uh, the night went on. And just a, a view out from the, there, looking at the lake further beyond. Night, the whole thing was designed with lighting in mind. Uh, again, it's hard for us to think about it, but in 1933, a lot of this electrical system that they were using back then was pretty new in terms of uh, the types of lights, whether they were sodium vapor lights or mercury vapor or other things, but they had to design the lighting in here so that uh, it didn't blind you at the base of the tower, but there was no way other than a, a direct beam to light up the top. And they, they ended up doing a nice job on it. So we'll take a look, we'll jump into, oh, the, they also ended up with one interesting little problem, which happened a couple times in World's Fairs. This thing was designed to be built for the 1933 World's Fair. All of a sudden, they decided to have a 1934 season. The United States government had not budgeted to operate it for the 1934 season. And that becomes a real challenge when you're dealing with, with the bureaucracy, uh, where you have to start doing your budget years and years and years in advance for some of these agencies. So they had to really scramble to make sure that for 1934, they could come up with money to maintain the exhibits. And luckily, they, the exhibit themselves had already been built and paid for, so that it wasn't a lot of new work that had to be done there. But there was an awful lot of uh, labor involved in keeping it going. So they were asking for volunteers from the local area, uh, docents, that sort of thing, to come and help out. And it became a theme in a number of uh, these exhibits that, um, you know, oops, the success is great. We're going to be open another year. Now, what do we do? We're going to jump over to... Uh, 1939 New York World's Fair. And this was another very large uh, pavilion. They spent $3 million on it. Uh, it we're, again, we're going back to the terms of the depression and how much $3 million could, uh, could buy. But this was a, a, a huge pavilion. I think if you take it in terms of today's money, it comes out to something in the $30, $40 million range. But this was, uh, we'll see as we get some more pictures of it, uh, something that absolutely grabbed the eye. There were 13 columns, as you see here in the center of it. They were representing the original 13 states. And there were uh, two uh, towers off to either side, the Tower of the Judiciary and the Tower of the Legislature. Uh, and they had these two uh, large statues on either side of it. We'll go more into the statues in a couple of moments. But we'll take another look here. This is uh, uh, Franklin Roosevelt's mother being escorted into the uh, pavilion during the opening day of the fair. Roosevelt was really, really uh, crucial to not only getting the World's Fair uh, approved for New York, but in uh, <laughs> FDR made sure that the US uh, pavilion was uh, one to be reckoned with. There had been all sorts of talk about different people. Why do we want to do this? Why do we want to put a fair in New York? That sort of thing. He basically overruled it and just said, we are going to go off and, and do this. And uh, he put a lot of money into it. Uh, here you can see the two statues on either side, one for peace and one for unity. They were designed by a fellow named Harry Poole Camden. They had a contest to see who would come up with the uh, uh, marquee figures on the outside. 430 different artists put in their sketches or their miniature statues and Camden was uh, uh, picked for it. For that, he got the massive prize of $10,000. But he also got a tremendous amount of uh, recognition for doing this. And he ended up doing several smaller pieces inside the pavilion. And he also did those two large eagles over the, uh, the doors. What's interesting is if you look at uh, original design sketches that he had for building the pavilion, uh, the statue that's on the left was shown in his design on the right and vice versa. So there was a lot of discussion whether or not they just put him in the wrong spot or what made him change his mind or whatever, but they, they don't match up to the uh, uh, original design. In the center, you have the executive hall. And again, remember we have the legislature on one side and the judiciary on the other, and in the center is the executive hall. 
this whole building was uh, pretty large. Each top of these towers here was 140 feet high, 110 feet deep, and 58 foot wide. Uh, big, big building. Uh, here you can see what it looks like in uh, in color. Uh, again, color shots not being as uh, common for the fair, so we got a couple sprinkled in here. But you can see how you have the nice uh, kind of, uh, I'm not sure what color that is there, the one on the top of the, the windows. The whole area in front of it was used a lot for uh, performances. Uh, they put, put a stage up in front. In this particular case, the stage is further down. But uh, it was a very popular area for gatherings. And off to the side of it, you had uh, the different uh, displays for the uh, various nations. It was likened to a giant peace table. Again, the whole talk was here about trying to keep um, you know, the world at peace, keep the US out of war. And the uh, concept here was that this was uh, uh, the nations of the world aligned around a peace table. And who was at the head of the table? The United States, who was going to lead us into uh, you know, safety and uh, prosperity. More of the crowds taking part of an event out there. And again, a very striking pavilion. I think we have some views coming up uh, further down. Yeah, here's going across the fountains. Uh, this is uh, giving an idea of the scope. The water in the center here is the fountain in the center of the fair uh, where the fireworks were shot at night and everything. This is quite a distance. But basically, anywhere in the fairgrounds, you could get a view of the, uh, the, the towers uh, standing out there. Another view of the statues. You, looking at the size of the people down below, you can get an idea of how large these were. Unfortunately, none of these uh, survived. The eagles might have survived. Uh, there's different places that have conflicting information on that, but the larger works were, like the other works of the fair, done in temporary materials for economic purposes. Again, looking all the way across at it, another color view. This was an interesting shot. Uh, they had all the, uh, the statues of, made of uh, plaster and gypsum and things like that. This was actually one that was done by a uh, uh, modern technology. It was called fennel resin, because this is the world of tomorrow, right? So marble statues are passe. Uh, you know, uh, granite statues are passe, but oh, one built out of fennel uh, resin. It's a, a translucent uh, uh, compound that resembled glass. Basically, he made a mold. You can see the mold off to the side. You pour this thing uh, in here, you cast it, and now he's finishing off the uh, edges on it. This particular thing uh, weighed uh, 1,500 pounds. Uh, I have not been able to find out if it survived or not. More views of the exterior. Again, nice uh, extra addition with color, G General Washington in the front there. And we had uh, some exhibits here, I believe. I'm trying to, I did, oh, I did. there was a courtyard and I, I must have missed uh, shots of the courtyard. I have one here real quick. In the courtyard, they had uh, famous uh, people from American history, uh, you know, Washington, Jefferson, uh, uh, um, you know, Ben Franklin, that sort of thing. They also had small little niches for each of the 48 states. They were uh, the state seal on their state motto, and they were arranged in the order of their admission into the, uh, uh, into the United States. So during the time we had this one going in New York, we had the lesser remembered one going out in San Francisco. And this was another very large pavilion. Uh, this particular one, 675 feet across, 435 feet wide, and it faced the Lake of Nations. And just like in New York, it had a large plaza in front of it designed for uh, uh, performances. There was a uh, large one. Uh, both of these things were visited by candidates for the election. So you had uh, Dewey and Roosevelt and others coming and giving their speeches out here. This uh, originally was called the Court of Nations, but over time it got to be known as Federal Plaza. Uh, again, you had two wings here, just like in New York, you had one for the uh, 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 judiciary, one for the legislature. You had these giant murals outside. They were done by a uh, uh, artist named Herman Volz, and he designed them, drew them out on paper, and then they were executed by a large team of work project administration uh, artists. That was one of the things the WPA did was try to put a lot of money into art programs that uh, they, they did an awful lot of things throughout the, uh, the country, trying to encourage uh, greater participation in the arts. And they, they sponsored 
plays, musicians, and that sort of thing. And here they had an army of uh, these uh, artists that would come and execute this, uh, this mural uh, for him. There were two murals. Uh, they were 360 feet long and 60 feet high, so they had to be done with a giant set of scaffolding. Uh, the north building was conquering the west by water, and on the south building, conquering the west, uh, uh, conquering the west by land. Uh, during the time these were done, they were the largest murals uh, on Earth. This section between the two of them was called the Colonnade Estates. Uh, there were uh, columns out here for each of the, uh, the states. They were uh, 265 feet tall. Uh, I'm sorry, they were this stretch 265 feet long. The columns are 100 feet high. And there was uh, one for each state, and they had the state seal. And they were arranged in three rows. The three rows, again, uh, for a common theme, executive, legislator, and judicial branches. The, uh, this pavilion was very well received. Uh, they gave out these really neat posters of the, uh, uh, that the WPA artists had done that are still very valuable today. They had all sorts of exhibits inside, again, for all the state of, uh, of the federal pavilions, trying to explain where your tax dollars went, where your, uh, you know, what you could do for modern farming, what we were doing for hydroelectric. One of the things that was very interesting was in the back was this was the very first B-17 bomber ever built, the prototype, the YB-17. And uh, this was, although we were having all the talk about uh, keeping peace, uh, the federal government was very keen to let everybody know they were getting ready for war. And the thought was that when the foreign government saw just how ready we were, they would never mess with us. And as we know, that didn't, uh, didn't quite come to be. Again, distant view going across the lagoon. You can see the uh, Court of Nations or Federal Plaza, just how busy it is with people uh, lined up there for uh, performances. So very, very busy uh, pavilion. Again, they ran into the same problem for their second year. What do we do to keep this uh, going? And luckily the, uh, the various state and uh, federal uh, agencies all came and, and got their budgets taken care of. So we're gonna hop over to Brussels in 1958, the first war, post-war fair. This was a very interesting pavilion. It was done by uh, Edward Durrell Stone, famous architect. And he came up with a uh, very striking pavilion, which basically down below you had a traditional building built with uh, pilings into the ground and concrete and all that. But above you had this massive dome area. You could see uh, how large it was. Was uh, he, the building was actually four separate buildings uh, and joined together in some, some spots we'll see. But the main center was this large dome here. Uh, the dome gave a tremendous amount of open space because it was supported by the uh, columns or the cables up in the roof. So there were not pillars up here to uh, uh, you know block any of these interior views. And we'll be looking at some of the interior displays a bit. The problem they had was they spent all the money they had on the building. Uh, this was back in the days of the Cold War, really enforced the days of Sputnik and all that. So they really wanted to have a building that drew the eye and got your attention and uh, really uh, told you that America was a force to be uh, reckoned with. But they didn't really budget a lot for the interior designs. Uh, awful lot of things, if you read about the fair, they were going to have a major thing there on uh, uh, Hollywood, and that kind of fell through, and uh, different things about American national parks and that. So they ended up going a lot of photo murals, and you can see stuff up here in the upper balcony and that. But uh, we'll take a look more in a moment for the uh, other displays. But it was very striking. You had the, uh, the flags out front. You had all these fountains. The fountains were also uh, moving fountains. So you can see here how they're swirling around and uh, very eye-catching. Just on the other side, off to the left of this, was the USSR pavilion. So the uh, the two of the uh, competing uh, superpowers very much in each other's face. But this was a, a wonderful uh, design. You can see the circular ring up at the very top, the compression ring that held the building together. And this was pretty much just like the New York State Pavilion, uh, Tent to Tomorrow. So you got a steel ring that goes around the center steel columns to go off into the, uh, the center, holding up a translucent uh, uh, roof up above, and uh, uh, it did the job. After Expo 58 ended, the United States, pavilion, the United States government gifted the pavilion uh, to, uh, to Brussels. Uh, the Fair Corporation moved into the pavilion uh, to uh, 
uh, basically do the shutdown of Expo 58 and the removal of the buildings. And they removed all of the upper level of the building, everything from the balcony up here above, uh, which is again to be temporary. And down below where there was theaters and other odds and ends, it had an 1150 seat theater, which is now used for a TV studio. So if you go to Brussels today, you can see a circular building, but it's only the first story of the building. The rest of it was taken down in the uh, post-Expo years. So inside you had some artwork, you had uh, some kinetic sculptures. You can see the fountains pumping out water, spinning things around. Uh, nice view coming down the uh, elevated walkway. You can see one of the pylons up forward ahead. Uh, Skyway off to the right, Vatican Pavilion. But again, the US Pavilion was uh, definitely an, an eye catcher as you, as you went through the expo site. Uh, it, it was very, very well done. And just some general views of the, uh, the tourists. You can see, by the way, uh, yeah, they change things over time. You have some American flags, then they put state flags uh, again through the, uh, uh, through, the, through the exhibit. Fountains spun around, got your eye. We're over near the USSR Pavilion looking over. You can imagine how the, this is on the steps of the USSR Pavilion looking over at the US. So the, uh, the juxtaposition between the two is very interesting. This is a smaller theater. It was uh, the Circa Rama Theater where the Disney organization put in the uh, 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 Circle Vision film, huge lines for it and it became very, very popular. Uh, and thank goodness uh, uh, Disney had uh, participated and built this uh, uh, film for him because the majority of what the US uh, A Pavilion was used for was fashion shows. You can see a model coming down the ramp into a, a platform out in the middle of it there. And that was the, one of the big things they had was that uh, several times a day they would bring models and different uh, US fashion designers would come in and the, uh, the ladies, and I think they were all ladies. I don't think I have any shots of any men uh, demonstrating the latest in fedoras or Stetsons or anything. But they came out onto the stage here, and uh, there's a little clock out here to tell you when the next show was. And uh, they, uh, they, they just had fashion shows. So kind of a uh, tremendous uh, waste of time. Excuse me, that may be the oven again. Hang on, we just close the door here one second. That's not the other man, that's the male lady. Welcome to life in the Connor world. So again, the, the, tremendous pavilion um, and fashion shows was kind of interesting. They were determined to do a very different pavilion than the USSR. And the USSR's pavilion was full of Sputnik and uh, oil drilling and all sorts of things. The United States pavilion said they consciously made an effort to show the softer side of life, uh, you know, uh, and what with the fashion shows, the photo murals and that. And in reality, part of the issue was the USSR was just so far ahead of us in some of those fields that there was nothing we could have done to put anything in there to, uh, to really uh, compete with them. And so they, they went the easy way out. We're going to go over to Seattle now, uh, one of the uh, really striking World's Fair uh, pavilions done by the United States government. This was a very, very large pavilion. This is the map from the, uh, the uh, official uh, um, tour guide of it. Uh, basically, there were all, all these uh, areas, you can see areas one through six, NASA had a separate pavilion up above, but this pavilion was designed to be permanently part of Seattle Center after the fair. And that's a really nice thing when you can take a pavilion and you can actually design it for uh, two things. One is a World's Fair use and the other is post-fair use. And we're going to see how that bedeviled the United States in, in several years. But this is a, a wonderful uh, structure. It's still in Seattle today, and uh, it turned out to be very popular. There was a lot of criticism after 1958 that you know the, the fashion show stuff in, in Brussels. So uh, they went all out in a different direction, 180 degree turn uh, to go for Seattle. This was a science pavilion and science, science, science. Uh, no giant displays about Hollywood or the national parks or uh, why you would come and buy Idaho potatoes or anything. This was 101% science. Uh, and it was very, very successful as we'll see in some of the, uh, the crowd pictures. The uh, arches here are very deceptively uh, airy. Uh, they basically had steel pilings that went up. 
And then they had to re work their way up the scaffolds to uh, put the uh, uh, lattice work up top. They look very light and, and uh, uh, airy, but they're, they're steel, they're concrete, and they're really truly massive structures. This, uh, they go basically 110 feet in the air. So you can imagine putting them together was not a, uh, an easy thing. This whole pavilion cost the United States uh, $9.9 .9 million to build the buildings. And that did not include the exhibits that came inside. And most of the exhibits inside were donated by uh, American industry, which were subcontractors to the government. And they were using it both to curry favor with the government uh, to try to get additional contracts, and also to let people know just how cutting edge their particular uh, design was. But uh, the pavilion was designed by a, uh, a fellow that uh, I have his name here, one second. Minoru Yamasaki. And if you're from New York and these arches look familiar, it's uh, very intentional because he also was the fellow that designed the motif for the World Trade Center in New York. So um, very, very similar design. We're sitting inside one of the buildings looking out. Uh, so the, uh, the very light, open, airy look to it. Uh, this was a souvenir slide you get at the time, a new terminology that I got a kick out of, Space Gothic. So the, the tower is going up there. And again, this is a nice uh, view. You got Chevron oil off in the, uh, the foreground off to the right, but this kind of gives you an idea of how large this particular uh, area was. This picture was taken uh, during the, uh, the uh, morning before the fair got open. And uh, as soon as it got open, people started lining up for this uh, particular pavilion. We're gonna take more of a hop through it in the courtyard, more of our space Gothic uh, arches. Look how nicely they complement the design here with the Space Needle. Uh, you know, again, the whole idea is uh, 1962, soaring for the future, reaching for the stars, uh, just a, a wonderful design. They did a number of years ago, a very nice uh, rehab of these towers. Uh, you can imagine it's you know, 50, 60 years old, they're sitting there. The concrete had started falling and had other issues. Uh, the city stepped in and did a, a massive job and refurbishing them. They, they look just brand new. If you do get a chance to go to Seattle, I really suggest you, uh, you go in and do this. This whole thing was done around a reflecting pond here. If you, uh, it was the largest body of water at the fair. And if you go and watch the movie, um, uh, uh, it all happened at the World's Fair with uh, uh, Elvis Presley. You can see him skipping through some uh, stones in the middle of the fountain. This was a giant complex. It was six acres. Again, really dominated the eye from pretty much any spot on the fairgrounds. You had the uh, Space Needle, the highest thing in the US uh, pavilion right behind it. Very airy look inside the, uh, the center. And even today, by the way, if you throw money into the fountains uh, during the fair, uh, they used it for the uh, upkeep of the uh, pavilion. And that's what they do today. And they actually did an archeological thing when they refurbished the area they had to pull out a lot of the plumbing and they found all sorts of World's Fair pins and memorabilia and artifacts that had gone down into the plumbing over the years. Looking down from the Space Needle, you can see again how large this particular concept, uh, complex was. And it backed right up to the outside. So if you were driving down the street past the World's Fair, that's what you saw. So we've seen a whole bunch of views of the outside of it. Oh, again, I'll do a real quick view of the lines. Uh, here you can see the line. This is just the people to get in. And I think I've got another one here. Yeah, even a longer line. 1962, these people are all standing out there for one thing, and that's to go see the wonderful world of science. So why don't we take a, a real quick look at some of the science displays. You had a multimedia film, six different projectors used to, uh, to drive these things that were all geared together in sync. But it was how uh, water and uh, air and everything was important to us. And it was the very first beginning of people starting to realize that uh, you know, the uh, uh, ecology is not a disposable commodity. And we need to start thinking about how the forces of nature and the forces of man can sometimes collide with each other. This is a particular interesting one. I'll zoom in just a little on it. But here you can see the uh, uh, exhibits. Oh, coins in the water will be preserved for the uh, permanent endowment of this structure. But here's the sort of thing you had, the film program, what's under the ocean between the tides, the strange birds of Midway, Night with Mr. Toad, uh, all sorts of things. 
they were full to capacity. Those lines of people you saw in each of these things, they all came out, they all lined up, and they, uh, they were very, very popular. This is a model of a uh, uh, theater that was built by uh, Boeing uh, down in the center. Uh, Carolyn probably recognized a, a planetarium set up in here. And it was again to uh, talk about our trips into space, uh, what the planets were and why uh, exploring the cosmos was important to us. Very interesting display they had here is weather satellites. Um, again, we all take it for granted today you know, uh, the weather, it's, it's, they're pretty good at predicting whether or not there's going to be a hurricane today or not. Back in 1962, weather satellites were still very, very new, Tyros and some of the others, and they had uh, these systems here were actually online tracking to the real uh, satellites up there. And uh, it was the first thing people had heard about satellites and uh, radar and that, that they would actually come out here and you could see them going. This also indicated back to the people at the time, we were not thinking the geostationary satellites, the satellites were orbiting the Earth, so it would come in and out of range. And this particular uh, device was indicating where the satellites were and uh, when they'd be coming back into uh, to range. So awful lot of interest of people for going in, uh, seeing what was going on with all the satellites. They also had displays of uh, the latest things that were being done in the world of bio uh, research, chemical research. And you can see this fellow in the background looks very quizzical here. But a lot of the uh, instruments in here were all things that were being used for the latest uh, designs of uh, medical research. And uh, you can't read the sign up here on the side. It's off at too much of an angle. But again, the, the companies that were designing and selling these things to hospitals and the labs and the government were very glad to uh, uh, try to, you know, make you understand where your, your taxpayer dollars were going. So we're going to go and hop over to another pavilion. We're going to leave, uh, oh, by the way, it's again, mention this out there today. It's a four admission museum. If you get a chance to go to Seattle, absolutely go. Uh, you walk in through the, the door and you're back in 1962. It has uh, survived amazingly well with very, very few modifications. So we're going to hop up two years now into 19... Uh, 64, the uh, very uh, ill-fated, we'll go through some of that uh, United States Pavilion, uh, which was celebrating the overall theme for the uh, US Pavilion was the journey to greatness. And there were all sorts of uh, different exhibits in the back, you can see challenge to greatness. But again, a, a absolutely massive pavilion. They had uh, budgeted originally $30 million for it. And when the time it got done, it came in at 17 million because like everything else, federal government is, uh, it seems like they have money for everything, but there are limits to what they could spend. So they, uh, they had to dial it back uh, considerably. And there were all sorts of issues again, just like with uh, the 1939 fair, uh, it took the president stepping in and saying, this will be done, it will be done big, and it will be done to show that the United States is a force to be reckoned with. So it was 150,000 uh, square feet of exhibit space, uh, basically two floors inside. Uh, it was basically one of the largest ones the U.S. had ever built for a World's Fair. Uh, half of the pavilion was done for a film called The American Journey. We'll go into the, more of that, a 15-minute film about the uh, country's history. But real eye-catching uh, wall, as we uh, World's Fair enthusiasts know, Kalwal plastic used to uh, 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 give the facade of the building. Uh, translucent panels with lights. We'll see more of that from behind uh, going, uh, giving a display at night. On my site, I have a, uh, a page about changes between the fair and there's a whole section on this little sign here. United States Pavilion, Win Norman uh, E. Uh, Winston Commissioner. And I don't know what he, uh, how he got this job, but he got his name plastered of all the people that worked on this uh, pavilion his name was there. And as we see through the pictures, his name uh, got in different sizes. It got moved around, uh, all sorts of things. Keep an eye on the lights out here. For guys like Joey that like to take home parts of lights and pieces from World's Fairs, uh, you can see here that uh, they, they made a bit of a design flaw that everyone would go and get their pictures taken up with the uh, eagle. Uh, and you can see right away, one of the lights in the center is pointing straight up and the other one is broken off its mount already. So we had a little fun. Uh, a woman wants to take her picture here, but we can also with Photoshop make her just go away. So remember Norman Winston, we're gonna be seeing a, bit, a lot about him. 
with all the work they did on the United States Pavilion, uh, you know, again, this big green and bluish looking pavilion at the end of the, uh, the street, who's it for, right? Well, the first signage they put down right here, tiny little sign down near the ground, the United States Pavilion. If there were 10, 15 people walking by the pavilion, you'd never see the name of it. So they later put the name up on the wall uh, just above it. And they put it on about the tiniest little set of letters you could ever imagine. They were probably about six inches tall, the United States Pavilion. So they got complaints about that and they took those down. And I've actually got pictures of the giant 12 inch letters that were up on the wall. Uh, held up by masking tape as the uh, glue was drying on it. So again, you start thinking about people building this giant building, 150,000 square feet, and maybe we should have put our name on it. It's just kind of an interesting little, uh, little design flaw. Again, we'll just take a couple of Hopton views around it. This is a very nice view looking over from the uh, Oklahoma Pavilion. You can see one of the uh, egg-shaped uh, bell uh, speakerphone booths over there. Okay, computer. Okay. Oh, that's the end of this set of pictures. One second, we're going to jump up to the next one here. Again, this uh, set of this eagle supposedly has been scavenged and lives in somebody's basement in New York. Um, trying to get somebody to admit it is uh, is tough, but. We're going to see him in the post or the sign in the post war uh, post ferry uh, years where the uh, the sign was uh, you can see he's been pried off. But a very nice view. You had the uh, the uh, uh, statue that's still in the park today. Uh, uh, you know, leading up to it, the uh, the, the uh, planters and everything. A very nice view. Just a real quick view of the statues. Down below, you had a memorial to John F. Kennedy, who had, we'll see a shot of him uh, coming up one of these albums at the groundbreaking for it. So uh, during uh, particular anniversaries, <coughs> excuse me, of his, uh, you know, his life, people would come and put flowers out at it. Many of the pictures don't show it, but there was a large moat that went around it with these fountains that uh, uh, you know, gave it some, some movement in that. A lot of people will remember the staircase going up to it giant planter up top with the uh, the tree up there. You could uh, walk the staircase. There's also an escalator. A lot of people did the staircase because the escalator would get very backed up. There was also a elevator in one of the four pylons which were used for staff access and for handicapped access to go upstairs. But this was inside some of the displays. Again, you had challenges to freedom uh, and they were very Interesting, they did not shy away from a lot of the controversies that were going on in the United States at the time. So you had a lot about civil rights, you had a lot about ecology and the amount of trash and uh, uh, waste that everybody would do. Uh, papers, newspaper headlines here about wars and other issues going on. This was giving an idea that in the year 1800, this was how much trash somebody generated. By 1900, they had generated this much. By 1965, here's how much the average person was generating. And I don't remember what year is predicted off to the top, but if we don't get a handle on this, we're just gonna be burying ourselves in garbage. Inside was a library. In the back, you can see some study carousels where you could use computer terminals and start bringing up information. I'm sure this was a usually successful thing. Let's go to the World's Fair and let's go visit the library. But it was a very well-stocked library. And uh, again, it had a computer, a very large computer terminal. We're going to be looking at that more in a moment, uh, showing the, the values of uh, computers for upcoming uh, uh, research. Nice quote from uh, Lyndon Johnson, greatness is a challenge, not a conclusion. A call to continue the American journey towards a world in which children may grow in freedom without fear of war anymore. Not quite there, but a wonderful sentiment. Inside, you had all sorts of displays. So we had a mercury capsule uh, on display inside. We'll see more of the interior displays coming up. Uh, again, the nighttime view of those panels. They were both lit from below and from the back, making this thing really shine at night. Very, uh, very eye-catching uh, uh, design and motif. Down below, we can see uh, people have realized, oh, everybody keeps breaking the, the lights at the bottom of uh, uh, Norman signs, so let's put a metal uh, railing around it. And again, go to my site. There were about eight different designs and how they try to protect that over the years. 
but they brought in all sorts of different things. If your own state did not have a pavilion at the fair, you could still come and participate and have a performance outside the United States pavilion. You could bring in marching bands from all sorts of schools. Uh, a lot of military bands and others performed here. Statue work down underneath, large expanse down underneath the pavilion. Uh, we'll see some square dancers coming up uh, entertaining down there. This is a small door here, uh, no particular signage or anything, but that's the one that went to the uh, uh, pylon that had the elevator. This was the staff and the VIP entrance into the, fair, uh, into the uh, United States Pavilion, very low key. All presidents is totally different than what we have at Walt Disney World. No audio animatronic, Abe Lincoln welcoming us in. Uh, we'll see more of uh, the Hall of Presidents coming in. And this is uh, kind of interesting. Somebody, uh, in, although we're in the no flash photography rule, somebody decided that they were going to do flash photography and were aboard the American Journey. This was a, a very uh, ambitious film. It was 130 fixed and moving screens. You had 55 uh, uh, people, uh, uh, grandstands. Just like at the uh, Energy Pavilion at Epcot, you would get in these uh, pavilions of these uh, uh, bandstands. You can see a power rail off to the right to uh, uh, take it going and off it would go. Uh, they took a 1200 foot trip and you had 159 projectors filling these screens. And what was interesting is the screen would be all the way uh, across the uh, track and you swear you were gonna move into it and all of a sudden the screen would pop up. You can see here there's curtains keeping you from seeing the next room. Uh, all of a sudden the screen would swivel up and the, uh, the bandstand could uh, go underneath it. All sorts of things done about Americana life. Uh, they were very proud of the fact they had all sorts of sounds of, of America. Tractors, train whistles, steamboat whistles, all sorts of things. The narration for this was written by no less than uh, Ray Black Bradbury. And uh, it, uh, other statistics, they had 1935 millimeter, uh, 1935 millimeter projectors, 14, 16 millimeter projectors, and 126 East, Eastman carousel slide projectors. Uh, and all these were sold for surplus after the, uh, the fair ended. And again, you can see one of the screens here has now been lifted up out of your way as your uh, grandstand is gonna go underneath it. So we get views of life, traffic horns honking, all sorts of uh, ambient sound, more pictures of the installation as we go through it. The uh, model, the Mariner satellite, you could go and see some of this stuff over in the US space park, but there was also uh, mentions of it as you went through the uh, exhibits here. Let me pop out of here. Uh, mention we had the library system inside. So this is the challenge of information, the library USA. These are some uh, federal government publicity pictures taken explaining all about how they have national libraries in various locations around the United States. Uh, they help with school libraries, special research libraries, presidential libraries, all about different types of libraries. More people will need more knowledge uh, because uh, we're going to a whole different world, the, the world of technology, the space age, that sort of thing. So uh, modern library, with a modern computer. So you had an IBM 360 computer in there in the background and you could uh, come and put a query in there. What happened in state and history? And you get a little uh, printed out three, uh, you know, a computer card. And this is of course the days when all the computers were in giant glass enclosed rooms and people wearing white coats and, uh, you know, uh, treating them like they were the gods of the future. Printer in the background, as you ask for information, you could get a printout there at the information center, take it home as a souvenir. This is Sperry Univac system. Talking about presidential libraries. And in a children's theater. So we will hop up here. So that we are. Uh, all know what happened, of course, with the uh, U.S. Pavilion. Just keep an eye on time. I don't. I could go more and more and more about the U.S. Pavilion. Ended the, the fair ended, and the uh, well, as a matter of fact, let me find some pictures of that real quick. Um, the the fair ended, and uh, it sat there for years and years. So uh, let me race through some of these real quick. Oh, Kennedy. Here's the groundbreaking. Uh, so it's December 14th, 1962. Kennedy came out. 
Uh, he's on the site of the U.S. Pavilion uh, making the speech, uh, dedicating it. You can see quite a few people turned out uh, that day for it. Uh, but now the pavilion uh, fair ended. They tore down everything else. We're at the top of the uh, Port Authority Pavilion. This was the day the uh, fairgrounds were reopened to the public. And the United States Pavilion sat there unwanted, unused. Uh, Moses hated it. He wanted it torn down. It was too big. He didn't want any buildings like this left in his park. Uh, he just wanted green space. The federal government was more than glad to give it to the state of New York or the city of New York because they did not have to pay to tear it down. Uh, they left a caretaker in place. He lived there for several years uh, until they finally realized we're never going to get the uh, city to do anything with it. Uh, I don't know how much it could have possibly have cost to uh, give, you know, have a caretaker living in there. <coughs> Excuse me. Imagine if somebody said, Hey, Joey, would you like to live here for free, free rent? You, you know, just keep an eye on the place for us. Uh, it probably would have been a very easy, uh, easy job to fill. But uh, he, uh, you know, the, the federal government, being the federal government, didn't take care of it, and they uh, they left the uh, uh, pavilion to rot. So I just they uh, they had a ceremony out here, and let me. Okay, here's a picture. This was uh, about 10 years later. They were coming back and were trying to figure out what we could do with the pavilion. So this is a, a 19, uh, actually this is close to the bicentennial around 76. You can see at this point in time, the sign is still, the concrete for the sign is still back there, but somebody has pulled off the uh, uh, eagle, which again, supposedly went with some construction work or home. You can see the larger letters that they had put up on the, uh, um, uh, the, the, the building over time. Uh, just flipping through it, here's where some of the science displays when it was uh, operational. I just wanted to get to more. If anybody happens to know who the speakers are, let me know. But the building sat there, all sorts of talk on what they were going to do with it. They were going to make it into a, a, a library. They were going to make it into, uh, uh, you know, all sorts of different things. Uh, then it, it, it basically caught fire under mysterious circumstances. And in 1977, uh, here it was the end. If we remember the picture before the statue and the pavilion in the back, you can see what's left of it by this point in time. This was the center core. What's amazing, uh, if you look at the two uh, planters with the trees, they had not had any artificial water put on them since 1965. So 12 years later, those trees were still going strong right up to the bulldozer plowed them in at the end. I how so wish that somebody had at least had the foresight if you couldn't save the pavilion, at least save the damn trees as a memorial, but nope, they, they got bulldozed down with everything else. So this was a, a massive thing. This was all the stairs that went up uh, during the, the fair. You could see the boilers and everything that it took to heat and cool this uh, pavilion all, uh, all torn down. Real, real shame to, to see it all uh, demolished and uh, just left for scrap. Again, wouldn't it have been nice if they had taken, you know, those trees and you could say, you know, hey, you know, Randy, Don, would you like a tree? Put it in your yard, you know, a, a real souvenir. But I just thought it was an interesting uh, kind of, uh, I don't know, a, a thing about how the, the world doesn't treat things with any sort of uh, respect. So we're going to hop up to 1967, another monumental pavilion for the United States. <laughs> Excuse me. 250 foot the geodesic dome. It was uh, designed by uh, Buckminster Fuller and an architect, Shoji Sada Sadao, S A D A O, uh, was the one that uh, brought it to fruition. Because designing a, a dome is great. You just take a dome, you know, a circle, pen, write it, you know, going to do it. But you do need to have a, a architect that actually makes sure it can stand up under its own weight. So we're going to take a hop and skip through it. And we're going to be looking at the uh, uh, inside, outside as we go through. These are in no particular order, but people getting ready for the escalator ride up. Um, inside, you had all sorts of things about American life. We now took the best of past pavilions. We had science, and we had science galore, but we also had an awful lot about America. So you had things here like the, these totem poles. You had all sorts of stuff inside about uh, American elections, so the political system, uh, collecting things like uh, Raggedy Ann and Andy dolls. We're going to be seeing some of that through there. So 
In the background, you can see the uh, USSR over there, just like in Brussels, uh, the two pavilions uh, show up in a lot of similar pictures. But this was just a wonderful, wonderful uh, uh, dome uh, covered in translucent uh, plastic panels, which uh, later uh, brought the doom to the pavilion. We'll go through that more. But you could see through the pavilion, particularly we'll get some nice uh, views at night. You could get some intriguing views of shapes that were inside. And inside the uh, space age, very, very much in, uh, uh, in, in uh, ex exists, exist, uh, exhibition existence here, evidence, that's the word, tongue tie. A lot of these things were models uh, because if you do shoot something off to uh, you know, orbit the, the moon or Mars or something, it's kind of hard to bring it back. But a lot of these things were actually real. This was a early Apollo capsule. It was used in one of the uh, flights to test the reentry system. We also had the uh, Freedom 7 capsule, the Mercury capsule flown by uh, Alan Shepard, and the Gemini 7 capsule were on display. They were the real, real McCoy. So this was, again, a space-flown uh, Apollo capsule. And keep in mind, we had not yet landed on the moon. Outside Flag Plaza, down below gives you an idea of the crowds. They had a huge uh, capacity for this particular uh, pavilion, uh, but as huge the capacity was, the lines were often monumental. Somebody was commenting on Facebook yesterday, the only way they got to see it was the mini rail that ran through it. You can see it uh, going through here underneath the USA uh, banner. Uh, that It was just uh, too, too long a line to, to get inside. But it was, again, look at the size of this thing. And again, you can see through the, uh, the panels, uh, the, uh, the tower in the center, the platforms out here, some of the space gear hanging up at the, the top. So up above, you had the parachutes that had brought the, uh, the uh, uh, Apollo capsule down. And there was tremendous interest because we were getting ready to go land on the moon, right? Uh, this was a, a big thing. So you had a, a, a mock-up of a lunar lander over here to the right. You had other things of the silver balloon. Again, one of the things using to land a, a probe up on, I think it was on Mars. Again, more space uh, displays. And again, we're just kind of hopping in and out as I threw these together. But looking from the outside, look at that line of people waiting to get in. I mean, it was, it was huge. It went out of sight around the, uh, the bend there. Each of these particular pieces was a plastic panel. Uh, there had been some uh, design of uh, uh, how do you keep the sun from coming through areas by rotating uh, covers and shades and that sort of thing. It never kind of worked the way it was supposed to. During refurbishment of the uh, uh, fair in post uh, Expo 67 days, a welder's torch ignited one of these plastic panels and the entire plastic skin on this thing burned an amazingly fast uh, uh, time, making it to say, thank God it never happened during the Expo 67 days because there were no sprinklers. There was nothing up here to keep that thing from burning and it could have been a real uh, disaster. Uh, somebody's writing a book about uh, a set at Expo 67. He was just asking me, is it true that you can actually sit on the astronaut couches? Yes, for those that are uh, space aficionados today, the thought of having millions of people come and plunk their butt in a genuine piece of space artifacts, or uh, it, it, it's sort of mind boggling. But here they had, I think it was eight different couches that were used by the astronauts who would sit. And the idea here was this was not where they were flown into space in one of these, but you're wearing the spacesuit is heavy. You need to sit down and rest in between tests. And it had to be sized for your individual measurements so that these seats had the names of you know, uh, Glenn, Grissom, whatever on it. And they later made a resurgence. We'll see them again at Expo 70 in Osaka. Again, out, outside views of it. <clears throat> Just flip through some more of these. A tremendous design. Uh, it, as you came up, it, it just really took the, the sky away. Here's the kindergarten area in front of it, but it loomed over everything on that particular island. Uh, very, very well done. In later years after the U.S., uh, again, Expo was only supposed to be one year, so the U.S. budgeted for one year. Uh, 1967 ended, they gave the uh, pavilion to the city of Montreal. Again, if you see a common theme, hey, let's give away our pavilion, then we don't have to spend the money to take it down. Uh, became repurposed as the biosphere, and uh, then they had the fire in it. 
sat derelict for a number of years and has been since repurposed. And uh, Carol and I were there about three, four years ago. Real thrill to go up to the uh, upper deck, which was a lot windier than it was at Expo because now that the steel work is still there, but the uh, plastic panels are gone. So the wind just goes uh, ripping through there. But uh, it's again, a great, uh, a great way to see it. The escalator ride we mentioned before, uh, one of the longest in the world. More folks waiting to get on the line. This flat area out here was used as a stage. I think I have a picture of it that uh, various performing groups from the United States could come and give uh, uh, you know, concerts, things like that outside. This kind of gives you an interesting idea of just how hard it was to build this thing. Look at how many welds you had to put together for each of these things to hold these panels in place. Amazing amount of uh, human effort to, uh, to put it uh, all together. I'll hop through these kind of quick so we don't hear all day. Again, the panels were all individually shaped to fit in there. They're not flat. You can see they have a, a convex shape to it. Just a few people waiting to go in. Nice view of the design element. The parachutes again. Mercury 7, the real capsule, Alan Shepard, pretty damn famous piece of hardware. This one was safely out of touch and you could not uh, get your mitts on it. Dusk is coming and you can see uh, some of the stuff inside. Nighttime, it really shown. Just hop through here a little bit more. I do want to show what happened to the US in the post 67 years. We're almost there. New York State off to the right there. I must have been fascinated with uh, parachutes. Mini rail about to dive into it. You had to have an air curtain to try to keep the air conditioned air inside. But again, it was kind of real cool. Uh, back before the monorail would go through the contemporary resort at Walt Disney World, you had the mini rail going through the uh, uh, USA Pavilion, and you just wonder if one may have influenced the other in any way. And again, here's that uh, concert area outside. So you can see a, a marching band out there, and they're performing kind of entertaining the, the folks down below. This was a giant piece of crystal glass that was given to the United States, uh, given by the United States to the Canadian government to celebrate its centennial year, which was the whole basis for Expo 67, 100 years of Canada as a nation on display inside the pavilion and is now on a uh, display in a museum in Canada. So part of the displays, besides all the rocket stuff, we had things about American life, again, quilting uh, designs, a whole collection of American dolls over the years. Uh, there was a collection of 300 hats that were done by uh, different types of American males that were uh, available. Uh, so again, antique dolls. All, these are all uh, vintage uh, things from American uh, campaign posters. Uh, uh, Harrison H. Taylor running, and again, all things pulled out there. Garfield, uh, Arthurs, Cleveland, and Hendricks. Many of the names all but forgotten. So now we move into the post-expo years. Um, that's what I was looking for. You gave away your pavilion, right? So now all of a sudden you come up with uh, the uh, issue of uh, you know, Man in This World, the successor to Expo 67. Do you ask for your pavilion back? No, because it costs a real fortune to operate it. So what you do is you go and you get other pavilions. You get the former Switzerland pavilion, you stick the word USA on it. You take the former Bell, Tele Bell Telephone pavilion, you stick the USA on it. So over the years, the USA moved around from one building to another, sort of like an unwanted stepchild. They actually, for the bicentennial year, they said, okay, uh, we can have some money this year, so why don't we get the biosphere back from you for a year, and we'll go off and we'll operate it as the uh, USA Pavilion for, uh, for, for one more year. So uh, again, kind of, kind of sad that, you know, it's nice that the USA was represented, and I remember going to these pavilions a number of times as I, I went back to Man in this World during my college years and stuff. But uh, it was sort of sad to see the, uh, the big, big dome sitting there without us uh, in it. 
And again, what was nice here by being the USA Pavilion, what could they do? They could take the Disney movie, America the Beautiful, and they could show it here in the Circle Rama Theater, which had previously shown the Canada film Disney had done for, uh, for Expo. So we're gonna hop out of 67 and we're gonna jump to Hemisphere. And I will have to make sure I get everything right. So Chris, uh, he's smiling, he's gonna see all the mistakes I made here. Hemisphere was another example of how you can do a pavilion and do it right. Um, basically, you know, these things cost a lot of money. And we've seen up in uh, prior years, you build something like the 62 World's Fair and you have a purpose for it. You can make a pavilion that lasts today. You build a pavilion like for a 64, you don't know what you're gonna do with it. And all of a sudden you end up with a, a white elephant on your hand. So this particular pavilion, there's uh, two sections, the round one there uh, in the center, the lower one down below. But these were designed by uh, uh, architects that came out of San Antonio, which is very nice because being a San Antonio fair, really nice that you can give some business to the San Antonio uh, uh, architects that do it. Uh, the idea of this particular fair was Confluence USA and uh, reading from the guidebook here, the blending together of many people and cultures into one uh, nation is the theme of the United States Pavilion. So they have three uh, aspects to it, the legacy, the harvest and the promise and a two building exhibit. So you have, uh, the, as I mentioned, the uh, large pavilion with a courtyard in between them. The smaller of the two down below here is called the Confluence Exhibit Hall. And up at the top was the, uh, the theater, another view uh, of the, the theater here. Chris was really nice to give us a tour when we went through there. It's, it's again, fascinating to walk through and see a pavilion being used. And it was used for, of all things, a federal courthouse. Um, so uh, down here again, the exhibit space in between the, the two of them. So we're gonna take a look inside the theater in a second little displays of some statues and these flying birds, really nice uh, piece of work. I'm just try to figure, where do you go to buy drapes that tall, huh? You, you, know, you, you, you probably don't pick those up on the rack at, the, at your nearby theater. <laughs> but inside we have the, uh, the theater. I love uh, the costumes on the, the uh, hostesses here, sort of uh, gave me flashbacks to the uh, Expo 67 days. But uh, uh, Chris, do you want to make any comment about what we're looking at here? Um, sure. Um, like you said, this was the uh, Confluence Theater. Um, the original idea for a two, two building complex came from the State Department a few years earlier when the idea of Hemisphere came about. And then they contracted a firm in New York City, the name escapes me at the moment, uh, that actually came up with the idea of a two building complex, an 8,000 square foot exhibit hall, and then the 12,000 seat theater. And uh, what you're showing here is the entrance to the Confluence Theater. Um, you can see, like I said, I'm, I know it was Keen Corporation that did the glass facade, but I haven't exactly traced down who did the curtains and, or who's doing them now, because actually the curtains are still actually there. Um, anyway, so you had uh, VIP areas downstairs. Um, I do know that those uniforms, they, the, the, you see there in this image, the ladies is 100% polyester. Because uh, I actually know one lady that still has one. Um, and then there were, I think there were about 45 VIP hostesses for the US Pavilion. Um, and then when you would, you would keep, queue up outside in the courtyard, you would come in here and you would enter to three exhibit halls, that three seating areas to watch the show. And the neat thing about that show was it was kind of showing uh, America as the great melting pot. So you had three sections of 400 seats. And you would be in your own little session, kind of like you know, when you first came across to the new world, you're in your small ethnic group. And you would start watching the show, 35 millimeter about the US history. And then when you got to the current time, um, everything would go black as you would hear loud, loud rendering thunders of like the Saturn V rockets, things like that, 707 jet engines. But you wouldn't hear would be the 35 millimeter projectors powering down, the curtains and everything retracting up into the ceiling or the two 70 millimeter IMAX style cameras firing up. And then about 15 seconds later, all of a sudden you would have these, this big massive screen in front of you, about, ooh, about 160 degrees and 60 feet high. All of a sudden you're no longer in your section of 400 seats. You're now part of the overall 
viewing area, uh, seating area of 1,200 seats. And you would yeah, see the rest of the film that way. Yeah, it was the largest uh, screen uh, in, the, in the world at the time. So it was uh, very impressive. Thanks, Chris. Mm -hmm. we, we do need to talk about uh, getting you on board to, uh, to take us through all of hemisphere. I keep putting it off because I can't do justice to it like you can. This is part of the display again about, you know, uh, you know, the founding of America and particularly here we see them coming in through uh, St. Augustine, Florida. Of course, Texas, being in Texas, you had to have a whole particular thing here. So the Pony Express is racing across country and singing cowboys, that sort of thing. Nice view of it uh, at night looking down from the Tower of the Americas model of uh, what the whole thing was to look like. And again, it's amazing that it uh, survives today. Here's the, the lower uh, exhibit. I know they put a lot of money into it over the years to keep it from leaking and other odds and ends, but... Uh... Not really. <laughs> not, not really. Uh... Yeah, after the fair closed, uh, well, actually, I don't, want to get, I don't want to jump ahead. Do you want me to tell the quick one minute story about after the fair? No, if we can hang that to get everybody to come back when uh, when you when we talk about hemisphere, that'd be All great. Right. I just want to try to stay on time today, but thank yeah, of you. Course. So we're going to go now to Osaka, which uh, to me it was uh, kind of an interesting situation. Uh, I'm going to uh, give you some views of it and talk about to me why it's how not to build a World's Fair pavilion. So we're over in Osaka. They've made a, a big effort here to uh, participate. Uh, so we see the, here we have uh, proudly the American, Japanese, and the Expo flag flying. In the background, you have that big pylon going up, holding up the roof of the um, uh, Australia Pavilion. And over here to the right is the uh, USA Pavilion with this, uh, if you look like a fabric, fl uh, fluffy roof, that's because it is. It didn't really catch your eye. Uh, a lot of, not a lot of signage uh, down, very low key. Here's the entrance to USA going in. So people are seeing the signage down here. But let's take a look at the pavilion itself. A gigantic, and we're talking really, really large. Uh, it was basically the size of two football fields with a, a giant uh, air supported cable roof. And they were very proud of the fact that this did not have a compression ring as we saw in uh, other supported roofs like the uh, uh, Expo 58 uh, exhibit, the, the New York State Pavilion and everything. You can see where the cables went across here uh, supporting the, uh, the roof. Uh, this was done through positive air pressure. So there was uh, the pressure inside the building was slightly higher than the pressure outside, which helped push the uh, fabric roof up against the cables and give it the, uh, the roof in there. But the design that they particularly wanted to uh, get in here meant that uh, the pavilion was very low key. Uh, it could not jut up very high because if any wind surfaces hit it, it would have played uh, hell with the support of the roof. So they, they came up with a, a giant design here. And I'll show you why I think this is a particularly uh, lacking pavilion. I mean, it, it doesn't look like very much, right? Not a lot of color to it, not a lot of eye appeal or anything. And you compare it to the USSR Pavilion. Again, you know, we're still in the Cold War days, 1970, uh, you know, we, we versus them. The USSR Pavilion was uh, very bright colored. Obviously, they're bright red, and it was very tall. From just about anywhere in the Expo 70 grounds, the USSR Pavilion is there. It's a, uh, I, uh, you know, eye-grabbing thing, a monument. You can orient yourself to where the pavilion is. The USA Pavilion, it's, a, it's a, to me, a circus tent. Uh, I'm, I was really disappointed in, the, in it. They had all sorts of issues and trying to, uh, you know, again, budget issues and all the rest of it. Now, the displays inside, different situation, but I think the building itself was uh, less than uh, uh, awesome. The big thing inside, a uh, section of Moon Rock, we'll go through that more, but they basically wanted to go through um, not just the technology of America, but what made America great. So they had 120 giant black and white photographs inside, done by 10 noted for photographers. You had a whole section on uh, the, the NASA situation. You had 21 uh, paintings representing the best of American art selected by the Metro Metropolitan Museum of Art, New York City. You had a sports section where you could go and see uh, the actual locker used by, I think, Joe DiMaggio and Babe Ruth's uh, uh, uniform from the Yankees and 
you know, uh, baseball bats by famous people. Of course, a big part of it was here on uh, uh, the space program. We had an Apollo 8 command module again. It's its use at the World's Fairs. Here's an outside view of, of the pavilion. Again, you can see very low key. Now, big, big lines, it was very popular. Not, not that many people were going in just to see Babe Ruth's uh, Yankee uh, hat. The moon rock, this was a big, big thing to be able to go and see the moon rock and, and go inside. We had some examples of American uh, manufacturing uh, history, a Stutz Bearcat. Uh, I would love to own that myself. I love the little windshield. The driver gets a little bit, uh, bit of uh, wind protection. His passenger does not. But again, everybody's lining up to go see the space stuff. Um, it's been very successful over in uh, Expo 67. Let's bring more of it over here. The lunar lander here was a, a real one pulled off the line uh, to, to bring over there. And again, the, the moon rock, very, very uh, uh, important piece of the, the display. Simulated space walk up ahead. Kind of interesting, the spacesuits here, uh, you know, the guys don't have any uh, 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 equipment packs or on them or anything. I don't know how long they'd last up there or how they maneuver without any, uh, any thrusters or anything, but they're having a nice space ballet. So XO70, I, I said, uh, you know, we can talk later about it, Randy, and I'll get your thoughts on it. I thought it was disappointing in that uh, it, it was not a eye-catching building. But the United States more than fixed that in Expo 74 in Spokane. They had originally thought, oh, my oven repair guy is here. So if I have to jump out, I'll be back. This was the original design for Expo uh, 74's US Pavilion, a giant uh, forest in the million, uh, uh, middle with uh, exhibit halls on either side. Uh, like everything else, budget, budget, budget. They had to scale it back. But when they did scale it back, they came up with a really nice design. Uh, given the amount of money they had, uh, this was a, a real eye-catching building. There had not been a theme structure uh, designed for Expo 74. The, the theme structure was the tower off to the right, an old train tower. Uh, they didn't have their own unisphere or anything. So the United States Pavilion really became a uh, theme uh, structure stand-in for Expo 74. Uh, again, a transport, a translucent supported roof. We're going to be looking more into uh, into that with a fabric uh, cover on it. It was uh, a real, real eye eye catcher. Again, from around the fairgrounds, you can see it just about everywhere. Big, big thing. They originally thought they were going to be uh, talking about uh, building this uh, thing. With, uh, I, I forget how much the uh, the money that they had projected for that original design. But they ended up spending $11.5 million, uh, which today would be about $80 million to build this particular building. Uh, it has uh, these steel cables going up and holding up the roof, 4.6 miles of cables. That's uh, a lot of stuff to hold that all up. We can see this pillar that goes up in here. It goes up to this ring up at the top. That ring is 55 feet wide. It weighs 88,000 pounds. So it needed something pretty big to hold it up so it could hold up the roof, right? Down below this quote here, the earth does not belong to man, man belongs to the earth. It has been attributed to chief Seattle, the Squamish Indians. And it's also been said, nah, he never said it. It was one of those uh, things that the press made up over time. So you can believe it or not believe it, but basically that was his supposed response when the government offered in 1854 to buy his tribal lands. And he said, you can take it from me, but I can't sell it to you because I don't own the land. Uh, the people own the land. So inside, a lot of displays on all sorts of things. The whole thing about Expo 74 was the ecology. So in the back thing, we have a, a thing about plumbing and how uh, you can uh, reduce your water and that. We're going to see more about the exhibits. Uh, again, the, the quote there, they went into uh, American, uh, Native, uh, Native American history with the totem poles uh, being an ancient artifact, and then we go into the trash mountain for today's artifacts of what mankind does. <clears throat> Population clock, uh, kinetic sculpture going through and showing us just how many people we're adding to this uh, tired earth of ours every minute, and that if we don't start planning for it, uh, we're just going to wear things out. 
kind of just a, a uh, eye candy shot, the river that ran right through the middle of the fairgrounds gave an interesting back uh, or foreground for the uh, USA Pavilion in the back. <clears throat> We're inside the pavilion looking out uh, the 22 in the clock tower, it means they were 22 days away from the fair ending. Uh, but um, you can see outside they had a, a thing for Chief Seattle, uh, the uh, person for the quote. But this gave me an idea of how much open space there was inside the uh, USA Pavilion. Again, looking across the river. Here's the tower that holds this thing up. That tower is 150 feet tall, roughly 14 stories tall. Uh, that is still there today. The building is still there today, but the roof uh, did not last. It had never been designed to last, uh, and the sun just, you know, over time ate, uh, ate it to pieces. When they took it down, they uh, cut it into squares, I think about one inch squares, and sold it off as a fundraiser for future funds to uh, uh, do the pavilion. But a very popular pavilion. Everybody's lined up here waiting to go and see the, uh, the theater uh, show inside all about the environment. The acre, the uh, roof, by the way, you can see how big this thing was, was two acres in size, a lot of plastic. So for one inch squares, I imagine they must have sold a whole bunch of them. More folks waiting to go in to see the show. Part of the displays inside. So you had theaters inside where you had uh, uh, things going on about uh, recovery, resources, recycling. Uh, you also had interactive displays. This was kind of interesting fountain. This whole fountain here was all done with things you would find in a bathroom. So sinks, toilets, so bathtubs and everything. And down below there were signs talking about how much water the average American uses and why the importance of uh, you know, uh, preserving water and also just how much water is lost through aging pipes and infrastructure and leaking uh, water mains, that sort of thing. Trash Mountain here, these were all things that you would be throwing away and ending up in landfills. So we had all sorts of ovens and TV sets and clocks and things and talking about how these things, again, this sounds hard to believe in uh, today where recycling is so big. 1974, the thought of recycling was brand new and revolutionary. And this pavilion really did a very good job of bringing forth the theory to people that this metal that you're throwing in these landfills will stay there forever, filling up landfills, but it also could be reused and to keep us from having to rip more of it out of the ground. So uh, very, very good uh, um, set of messages for it. They also talked about how we need to work what we do with nature, that you have all these pests that if we do not properly control them can eat our, all our crops are alive, but the key to them is not bombing with DDT and other, other chemicals that are injurious to the environment, that there's things we can do to try to, uh, through you know, proper control, one pest that can eat another pest, uh, you know, try to keep these things in, uh, in sync. Again, the two theme structures, of, uh, the de facto theme structures of the fair. If you go back to Seattle, to uh, Spokane today, rather, I really suggest you go to the park. It's a wonderful, wonderful city park. Uh, there are some amusement rides and things underneath this giant dome here today. Uh, some more of the giant beetles and stuff. But uh, very, very glad that the city of Spokane has, uh, has held on to it. This I thought was an interesting juxtaposition. I ran, uh, it was just down the road from the US and this was when we were having all of our giant conflicts with them. But one last shot, uh, just pretty flowers, the A&W sky float uh, above. Uh, again, get to Spokane, take a, a view of the uh, uh, area, you will enjoy it. Real quick, we're gonna hop through Okinawa, 1975. Uh, we saw this a couple of weeks ago. US had a pavilion, uh, a fairly large size one when you consider uh, how far away this is and how little economic impact people going to Okinawa are, are likely to uh, have to the United States. But here is the ribbon cutting uh, ceremony here, a little uh, sign about who the, uh, the people were uh, opening it up. So that's July 19th opening it up. And for a fairly small, fairly forgotten fair, the U.S. had a, a, a pretty large uh, exhibit out there. Much more eye-catching, I think, than uh, Osaka. Sitting here with bated breath to find out if he's going to do a 
couple hundred dollar oven repair or if I have to eat a McDonald's for the next three months. So some nice views of it. So Okinawa, again, the US went out of its way, but we're getting unfortunately down near the end of the uh, uh, US, the thing is of note. Matter of fact, we're gonna go to what I think was the last significant US pavilion, which was uh, 1982 in Knoxville. So it's in the background, it's across the lake, and this was a very striking structure that was uh, built for Knoxville. And uh, uh, it was uh, 400 feet long, and uh, it was very, uh, very eye-catching, and it had some very successful exhibits in it. Down below, this kinetic sculpture, an aluminum wind vane got blown around, but uh, uh, inside was really made it interesting. A lot of stuff going on about Knoxville, again, about energy. Uh, so we had in Spokane, it was about recycling, now about energy. And this was not only how do we, uh, you know, do things like, you know, coal mining or uh, gas in it, but how do we get into things like solar panels, solar energy? Uh, what do we do for uh, passive heating systems? Uh, an awful lot of stuff done uh, inside. And the U.S. had a very uh, interesting set of displays in here. We're going to be hopping in and out as we go back through here. But they, uh, they went all out, again, invited a lot of American industries to come in and talk about uh, what they were doing to try to make the US less dependent on foreign oil and how we were gonna be building our houses, our buildings, our offices with uh, things like uh, tinted glass can cut down the amount of sun that comes in and therefore cuts down the amount of heat that comes in and therefore cuts down the amount of uh, fuel that we need. So lots of displays all throughout here. Uh, there was a very interesting display inside the USA Pavilion about the USA at past World Fairs. So they went through the uh, Crystal Palace exhibition. They had a nice display of uh, plastic dinosaurs from the 64 World's Fair and others. Uh, it's, it's sort of a nice homage to the past. But this was a great pavilion built for one purpose and one purpose only, the World's Fair, and they didn't learn anything from New York. They didn't know what they were going to do with this pavilion after the fair ended. So in typical United States government fashion, they gave it to the uh, city of Knoxville, which in typical city fashion said, thank you very much. Now, what do we do with this? And the answer was nothing. So it sat out there at the end of the park. And this is another park. If you do get a chance to go to Knoxville, very nice park, uh, really great to go and visit it and see what it, it looks like and everything. But it sat out there until 1991. Uh, it, it developed uh, leaks. It uh, was uh, getting ripped apart by scavengers and everything else. So in 1991, in a controlled implosion, they brought down the, uh, the pavilion. And uh, today, all that marks its uh, uh, a memory is uh, photographs and a parking lot. So a real shame. I mean, it's a really great design. You would have th thought something could have been done with this building, but in Knoxville's defense, you know, they, they got a gift, but they didn't have the money to do anything with it. So, you know, what, uh, what do you do when you don't have the money? You tear the sucker down. So down below, you can see steam engines and uh, all sorts of things, you know, because America used to be so reliant on steam power. Now we're starting to talk about uh, uh, atomic energy power. Well, one interesting thing about the pavilion, the United States government uh, put this pavilion there at the end of the affair, made it a real eye uh, catcher. And then the uh, uh, World's Fair Corporation signed this contract to put the sky ride up in here. And they had to go and actually execute a contract between the federal government and the uh, sky uh, rail operator to attach the building, uh, the supports for the sky ride onto the uh, federal pavilion so they could get to the end of their intended route. So you know, amazing amount of correspondence between the federal government and the, uh, the uh, Knoxville people, making sure that they weren't gonna damage and that the, the metal supports are strong enough to, uh, to do it. Nice model, the space shuttle down below. Just a couple last views of it. Again, what a shame, you know, it sat there again until 1991 and then they just blew it up. So the great, uh, great pavilion. So we're gonna hop out in Knoxville and we're gonna go over to uh, 1984 New Orleans. And this was the uh, US pavilion here. It was the largest exhibit at the fair. And it was, uh, it was kind of interesting, uh, it was built this facade's very interesting. Outside, you had all these American flags, which gave a 
nice amount of color and that sort of thing. We're going to take a look inside. I think Barry Howard did some displays for it, which were really cutting edge and every well done at the time. Uh, the pavilion itself was nothing monumental because again, budget starts coming into this. And this is where we're getting to the end of, uh, you know, interesting United States pavilions because everybody in other parts of the country is starting to say, why should I put money into something that's going to help New Orleans? What's it going to do for me in North Dakota? What's it going to do for me in Wyoming? What's it going to do for me in New York or California? So the U.S. budgets are starting to get really, really slashed. So in this particular case, rather than build a, a monumental building like they had done in Spokane or a really uh, interesting building like they had done in Knoxville, this was pretty much a warehouse type building. And that's actually what happened after the fair. The building was sold to somebody for use as a warehouse taken down. And I, I don't know if it was ever put back up or not, but it was basically a giant steel box. You could imagine if you just put the word Costco on the front of this, that's uh, basically what the, the building itself was. So the building wasn't so exciting. The uh, displays were, and we're, uh, we'll be seeing some of those in a second. So the court of flags outside out there, um, where all those American flags were, concept art of what the entrance was going to look like. And it came out pretty close to it, didn't it? So that's the way we're going to uh, build it. And that's the way we actually did build it. So uh, nice that they were able to get it done. Again, this is a pretty large size building. Uh, you can get an get a idea of the scope of it, the, the bus and everything sitting in front. Uh, Window lists, uh, again, as a lot of World's Fair exhibits are, so you can maximize the amount of interior space. I personally would have liked to have seen more done on the, mo uh, the walls of the building, maybe a red, white, and blue motif or something to, uh, to draw the eye to it, but it was uh, you know, the best they could do. Uh, looking out from the US uh, pavilion, the courtyard, and our neighbor Canada off to the side, and just peeking into frame, the Orbiter Enterprise loaned by NASA. Uh, maybe uh, we'll do a thing on NASA at the World's Fair is separate because I, I count them separate than the federal pavilions. But they went for this nice set of uh, blues and everything. And maybe when we get Barry, we can talk about it more because a lot of the uh, influence inside of this was done about water. The whole theme of the pavilion was water, the source of life. So, uh, you know, I, I, again, I want to done red, white, and blue. What do I know? But they, they, had a, they went with this for a water motif. And let's take a look at some of the uh, things inside. Barry was very kind to uh, let me have some of his interior shots. So we'll start outside. We, we again, we're going to go in through the main door, take a walk inside, and all sorts of things about water. I had a moving walkway going through here, uh, all sorts of interactive displays, and some cutting edge for 1984 computer games that we're going to see. So again, these are all. Uh, uh, courtesy of Barry Howard, who is a master in taking a low budget and turning it into uh, some very interesting uh, displays. Down at the end of the moving walkway. Waterfall, stream, boil, melt, freeze, irrigation, all things about water. And all about water science is kind of interesting. These plastic balls that he used this motif here, some lit up with displays inside. Others just kind of eye candy. A great looking design, isn't it? You really feel like you're walking through uh, water molecules. So they had interactive things, water in its different states, ice, vapor, mist, explained to it. And it was actually a water fountain, kind of interesting. So if you're talking about water, you might as well give some people water. But you know, what is water? It's ice, it's, uh, it's air molecules, that sort of thing. And here's the computer games. So the H2O game and press the joystick for operation uh, for instructions. So we all feel like we have a flashback to a Atari 2600 time at, at this particular thing. H2O game, you would uh, you know, take your water molecule, uh, try to get it into uh, you know, around obstacles and get it from the sky down through a pipe and deliver it to people. So here, your goal is to pilot a water molecule through the water maze to reach and nourish the flower. It will be uh, moving letters, which you may touch to gain points and learn more about water. Your score is determined by your ability to avoid the walls of the maze and the amount of time it takes to get there. So you take an existing game, you know, uh, you know, uh, we, I think we had asteroids and others, and you change it into a water molecule game. But water is very important. 
and uh, they did a very nice job, I thought, on, on putting it all together. So again, we've got to get Barry to talk more. He's done some great displays at, at fairs. So we're going to jump out of uh, 1984, and we're going to go uh, up to 1985, Scuba Expo. At this point in time, the United States has said, we are no longer going to be part of the Bureau of International Exhibitions. The uh, whole thing with the uh, 1984 New Orleans World's Fair uh, going bankrupt, and it was a real uh, you know, uh, black eye on, on World's Fairs. Uh, and the federal government said, we're not going to bail these guys out. If you guys want to have a World's Fair, you can do it without us. But again, politics has become such a big thing. We're not going to put the money into a World's Fair in your city, because you're not going to put a World's Fair in my city. So we're just not going to put money into a World's Fairs. So uh, at this point in time, you have to now start going to American industry, which has been the case ever since to, uh, to get them to finance the money. So uh, I remember going in here and I felt like you could take in the name uh, United States off. This was to me the Texas Instruments Pavilion and I make fun of Texas Instruments. It was really nice that they did it uh, and they had a, a very interesting display, but it was very, very one-sided. I mean, I'm a computer geek, uh, but uh, I was very disappointed that I didn't feel there was anything in the United States Pavilion about what made America great. I felt it was what made, uh, you know, uh, Texas Instruments great. Uh, so to me, it was, it was a real disappointment. And I walked over to others like the Canada Pavilion and saw what they had done. And I just wanted to fake a Canadian accent for the rest of my visit. Little gift shop outside little theater inside. Again, the, the movie uh, didn't make any particular impact on me. Giant structure supported by uh, cables outside. Uh, again, not pointing any uh, you know, fingers at the structure. Cheap, economical way to do it. And again, if your roof is held up on the top, you can put all sorts of displays and exhibits inside. Uh, again, small little signage down below for the United States. I would have really liked to have done something to jazz it up. Because when you walk down to it again, to me, it just says circus tent. More of the exhibits inside, more of the gift shops outside. In the fountain area here, uh, the, uh, besides um, uh, Texas Instrument, a major sponsor for it was Coca Cola. Uh, again, they've been a, a very faithful sponsor for the American exhibits at a number of uh, fairs in the, uh, the post-US uh, sponsor days. So interesting pavilion, but um, not a great pavilion. We do get a chance to go back to a little bit of greatness. Uh, this is a model of the USA pavilion at uh, Expo 86 in Vancouver. But by now, people have realized, not just the United States, but building massive pavilions for massive millions of dollars and tearing them all down is an economic model we can't sustain. It's also not earth friendly. So let's start going to the idea of prefab buildings that can be repurposed, taken down or whatever. So this is a model of the US pavilion uh, outside a very eye-catching red, white, and blue USA motif outside really drew your attention to it. This is the sort of thing, I look at this and look at Osaka and figure why the hell didn't the guys in Osaka at least do something like this? You know, I mean, you have your name down on your door People know it as you're going in, but the, the you know the USSR was soaring in the sky. I really think we should have stuck something like this on Osaka. So a lot of people took a lot of pictures of uh, this particular uh, uh, area. So inside we have a letter from Ronald Reagan uh, talking about the U.S. Pavilion and uh, uh, memory of the spaceship Challenger had uh, been lost. Uh, a lot of stuff, as we will see going through here, about the space program, uh, because being up in Canada, Canada made some integral parts to the uh, Challenger program. Uh, they had all sorts of things about exploring Mars, space station, uh, again, modules that were built, a robotic arm on the shuttle done by uh, Canada. So this is all part of the uh, interior displays here, space shuttle itself. Docking the Canadian arm and display up there. You can see, of course, Canada big module up there on the on the International Space Station. Just flipping through some of these. So I thought that was a good pavilion. Also on here, again, the, the tower is not immediately visible. It's blocked over here, but you know, nice signage on the outside to the uh, draw your eye into it. 
And the major focus, again, was NASA and our loss of the Challenger. Uh, matter of fact, that was the, the one big thing inside. But uh, again, I, I think it did a nice job. Uh, it, it, it was well attended. You can usually see uh, people in line for each of the uh, uh, exterior shots of it. Uh, it, it drew your eye to it, let you get to know there. And uh, going to Expo, after 85, being really disappointed in the US Pavilion, I was uh, much more impressed by going to the 86 and seeing, uh, you know, some, seeing something kind of neat for the, uh, uh, the USA. I think we've got enough pictures of the space shuttle here. So we're gonna hop up now. We're gonna go to Brisbane. I only have a couple shots. Brisbane, I'm still restoring pictures. There's a fellow that's an absolute whiz on uh, uh, Expo uh, 88. And I've got to try to talk to him. But uh, I posted this online yesterday and somebody said, oh, the, the shipping crate container. And again, this is uh, not to be fair to the United States. This has been what the motif has been in many recent fairs. Let's go to one giant uh, design which works for everybody and we can then go and replicate it and everybody can put their own uh, 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 exhibits on the, uh, you know, the, the motif of it on the outside. So we've seen some of the next ones. We'll go through these sort of quick. We're gonna hop up to 92 Seville. We have a GM prototype car, again, sponsored by uh, industry. So you have GM with their uh, car, you had the Yankees there, you had uh, Peter Max, we had Coca-Cola, uh, all sorts of things that were done by industry. Because the US, uh, I think, very short-sightedly does not uh, provide funding for these pavilions. For all the shortcomings I've had of some of these pavilions, we have to be glad that American industry has stepped up to the plate and has let us participate because there's been some situations where it looked like this is the entire world uh, going to participate, except the United States, which to me would be a real, uh, real embarrassment. So, uh, you know, and, and some of these uh, pavilions, could they be done differently? Yeah, if you had the money that, uh, say, the USSR was putting into their pavilion, yeah, maybe we could have done something different. But if we're going with our hat in our hand, we're asking IKEA, not IKEA, or, uh, you know, uh, Coca-Cola or some of these others to, uh, you know, uh, put it out there, we ought to be glad for what we've got. Just a couple of weeks ago, we were in uh, Korea, Tehon. Again, the, the sort of motif that's been popular since Expo 86 premiered it. Uh, common themes, common structures, uh, different designs outside. Same thing we did a week or two ago, United States, uh, uh, right next to Malta. We're in uh, taking a look at Seville. I'm uh, sorry, Lisbon rather, and we're uh, just, uh, and I guess we'll end it right there. Looking at the time-wise here, we're running out of time. So let me stop sharing. And uh, let's see, uh, oh, lots of quotes today. So uh, I'm gonna open up as I'm reading the quotes of people to have comments, uh, suggestions or things, just raise your hand, either with the raise your hand button or wave frantically, and I'll be glad to unmute you. So thoughts, memories from anyone? Randy, you're still muted, sir. You need to unmute yourself. There you uh, go. Expo 70, we, you know, we talked about it when you had the presentation on that fair. Um, there was another design that was proposed, a couple of designs that were definitely above ground. One was like four inflated spheres uh, on a tower probably would have been about two or 300 feet tall, I guess. Um, but once again, I didn't say budget. I think the US Pavilion there, um, its structure, its engineering was, was its attraction. And of course the moon rock, uh, you know, it was one of the first, if not the first uh, inflated roof held up, you know, held in place by cables. But uh, yeah, certainly the USSR Pavilion was more eye-catching. I just, you could see it anywhere on the site, USSR. You could be anywhere and see it. And yeah, uh, I'm sorry. It was interesting. We were actually watching a uh, uh, rerun. We've been binge watching the Amazing Race uh, series, my family lately. And they were in Russia. And what's in the background? You can see off in the distance the USSR pavilion. Yeah, they, they took it back. 70? Yeah, it looks like that. Oh, wow. I didn't know it had been moved. I thought it had just been just. Uh, 
destroyed. Wow. I, I have to verify it, but there's a pavilion that looked just like it. So, I mean, in, in, in Moscow. So, yeah, I mean, it's a, uh, I mean, the USA pavilion was a massive engineering marvel, you know, and they had to build it down into the ground to uh, uh, be able to provide the anchors for all those cables to hold up the roof. But I just thought it was blah, you know, I mean. Uh, yeah, I mean, when you were in, you didn't go, right? You no. did not. Yeah, when you were inside of it, it was very impressive because it was this huge open area. Um, like we said, two football fields divided off a little bit. Um, but like I say, you know, the, the original plan was really spectacular and would have, you know, you, it probably made even the USSR pavilion, you know, blase by comparison, but it never was built. Somewhere I've got a picture of it. I, I uh, you can look it up online, uh, what the original plan was. And then also, um, uh, we discussed that, you know, at Expo 92, the US pavilion. Can't remember if I, if I sent you a picture of the original plan for that. that I think that, you did, yes. Okay, yeah. I couldn't remember, yeah. So once again, budget cuts. And, and that was right in the, that kind of was right in the middle of the budget cuts. It had been planned. Um, that's when, you know, uh, President Reagan took us out of the uh, BIE. They really didn't know what to do with it. They had a, just very short uh, time frame to get industry to step in and, and you know, they did the best they could, but it, it was an embarrassment, definitely an embarrassment. Yeah. Well, it's good. Thank you. Appreciate it. I was going through the ch uh, the chat. I did make a mistake in the U.S. Uh, pavilion for '64. I had initially said it was a uh, IBM system, which we had intended to be, but IBM uh, went over their own pavilion and it came up with a Sperry. Uh, well, it wasn't Sperry at the time. Uh, Univac 495 computer. So I did misspeak on that. Joey, you had your hand up. Hey guys. Hi, Bill. Hey, Joey. Uh, there can't be a, a, any kind of talk about the United States Pavilion without me uh, bringing in a piece of it to show you uh, right here. Uh, I know a lot of people wanted to see this. It's a girder that uh, got pulled out of the ground. And I just wanted to mention the, um, the reason why those trees survived for so long is because New York City trees are different than any other trees in the nation they can survive on cigarette butts and urine. <laughs> so uh, yeah, and Bill, I totally agree with you. Someone should have um, pulled one of them out of there at least. Um, that would have been a, a great thing to do. Yeah, I mean, they survived because the, it was an open air center to the pavilion. So if the rainwater that came in or melting snow or anything kept them alive. But I just thought, you know, if you had any sort of thought how much could it have taught, cost to dig out the tree, put it in a pot, and then put them out in front of whatever you build out there and just, you know, it, it, it was a real yeah. shame. Yeah, it was a real shame uh, when when they took it down too because they they were going through so many, um, uh, so, uh, so many theories about what to do with it and each one came to a grinding halt. So I think uh, a lot like the Aquacade, uh, it was just doomed doomed from the start. Um, and the, uh, I remember uh, driving, my dad and I, we were driving on the Van Wyck Expressway in 1972. And um, the lights of the United States Pavilion were being flicked on and off. What we saw, we didn't know it at the time, was the uh, famous Phantom of the United States Pavilion. And, yeah. and he, he was a homeless man that they put in there and he cleaned up a lot of uh, a lot of the pavilion. He kept it tidy um, and uh, eventually they got rid of him. Before that, there was a security guard there as well, but uh, he, didn't do, he didn't do too much. But to see the lights of the pavilion lit again is almost um, like, almost like a, you had a dream about it lighting up again after all the, all the time it sat there. You know, the lights actually are interesting because if you do a, a review, there's a giant lawsuit that went on for years between the city of New York and the federal government about the electrical connection for the, and the sewers and everything for the federal pavilion that they never build the federal pavilion for years for the uh, uh, electricity. And they said, oh, okay, we found out you guys have just used it because they looked at the meter in 65 and they looked at the meter in whatever year. 
and said, now you owe us all this money. And the federal government said, but we gave you the pavilion. It's your pavilion. And I said, yeah, but you guys were caretaking it for us. So you had the responsibility to pay the electric bills. I don't know how they ever resolved it, but they were both back and forth and all that. During this point in time, they then realized that the guy who was running the tower on the terrace restaurant had not been paying his electric bills. And he had not been paying <laughs> evidently because he bypassed the meters. <laughs> so they, they had all sorts of, you know, trying to figure out, you know, you, you shut down the fair and we remember, you know, the, the transformers, everything they had, they were still trying to figure, where's all the electricity going? The world's fair is gone. Well, the USA pavilion, it, the guy was still running the air conditioner, you know, I mean, yeah. why not? It's, it's free, right? But yeah. yeah, New York City decided they wanted their money back. The federal government basically told them, go, go pound it. And I'm pretty sure the federal government won. And by the time we got in there, um, all that was, all the transformers were melted. Uh, everything was, uh, everything was destroyed. Uh, we went into the area that you showed where the library was, and that was just totally, the roof, the roof was, uh, the roof was, uh, part of the roof was caved in. So, but we did manage to get this, which um, I don't know if your viewers could see this. Yeah. This is a piece of the track that uh, was on the ground and, uh, Years ago, my daughter made a face, uh, so we hung it up on a tree. Um, but this was one of the pieces of track that were on the ground uh, for the ride. And we think we even saw the ride. We called it like a three-tier, it looked like a three-tier uh, dumpster. It was huge. And they threw all sorts of garbage in it. So that was in there at the time. So I don't know, I guess during demolition, Everything was just anything that was saved uh, was just taken out. That was the end of it. Yeah, I mean, as you know, when they moved out, they left all the glass display cases in place. You know, they'd open them up, take out all the little American dolls or you know that sort of thing. They left yeah. all the glass display cases. But they took out the projection system because again, that was all sold off at uh, at auction. But you know they couldn't find any use for what do you do for 120 uh, seat you know, moving van uh, grandstands that go through a multimedia theater? Yeah, and they had a use for it, so they left it in place. And they, they, Bill, did yeah? I'm, I'm yeah. sorry, Bill. Go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Didn't didn't you have a picture? You would you were showing the lettering on the front of the United States Pavilion. Isn't there a photo that someone taped it up with masking tape? Yeah, I mentioned that when they took off the small letters and put on the other ones, they taped it up with masking tape, basically waiting for the glue to set. So, I mean, again, really, really tacky. And uh, if you go to my site, worldsharephotos.com, there's a whole section on how, you know, the fair changed over the years. And I have a thing about the signage on the, uh, the uh, U.S. pavilion. And that Norman Winston one's really interesting because yeah. his name was off to the side and I guess that wasn't good enough for him. So he, he now had it moved over to the center where I'm trying <laughs> to figure out was it in the center and they moved to the side because too many people were taking pictures. I don't remember the, the, the you know, order that it went, but it was little letters, big letters, move letters. And then they, uh, one of the things they did for us as Boy Scouts was to have us stand there and we'd have to stand there at attention of the arms behind our back and our legs spread, you know, stopping people from coming up and climbing over the rail to get their picture taken. But it was, uh, and, and you realize you're 15 years old, some, you know, teamster comes up and he's going to take a picture. I'm not going to stop him, right? <laughs> you can do what you want to do. But it was a, uh, uh, again, that whole thing with that sign, they, they just kicked the, the pole, the lights from left to right and broke yeah. them. And like I said, that, that supposedly that eagle is sitting in somebody's uh, house in, uh, in Brooklyn. And, uh, yeah. you know, I, I do hope it's true. And I hope, hope whoever has it, you know, it doesn't, uh, you know, uh, what you call it, you know, when they move out, it doesn't show up in you know, somebody's landfill. <laughs> Great show, Bill. Fabulous. Thank you. Hey, Joey. Do, Hi, Randy. Yeah, hey, do you know if any of those, uh, the panels on the outside of the pavilion uh, with uh, plexiglass, fiberglass, wherever they were, did they survive any of them? Um, there are some people I think have some of them. Uh, they were made of the Caldwell material again, I believe. Um, Jim Brown might be able to fill you in on that, but uh, when the pavilion burned, uh, they took down many of those panels. I think the entire front they uh, they ripped it they ripped it all down. So someone probably saved something. Yeah, because that was certainly the most eye-catching feature of the building. And I, 
you know, I'd love to have this very mid-century. My living room is, is decorated mid-century to have maybe like a four by eight foot panel yeah. you know, up against the wall, maybe six inches from the wall, illuminated from behind. Yeah, they were they were beautiful. They were like em emerald green. Yeah, yeah. And they were really, really beautiful. I never met. We never made it up there. I know Johnny Pirro made it to the roof and got behind the panels. He actually could go behind them, um, but we never got that far. We went to the the dark rooms, we call them, and we would run out of there every time like a pigeon flapped its wings. You know, we were so scared that we'd run out again. Yeah. <laughs> Here's a view of the uh, post fairy years, and you can see some of the panels have started breaking out. Uh, yeah. You know, so you can see in, in, inside they had fluorescent lights behind that would light it up. So uh, in, in this particular case, one section has come down. So I know the company that made it still makes this stuff, uh, Randy. So if you'd like to get it done for your place, Calwell Manufacturing can whip you up a set of uh, plastic panels and. Uh, uh, yeah. If you do, I you know let us know. We can, you, you, just think I need to make for a window. I mean, a little thing lit up on your wall, just you know, eight by ten, you know, color square or something. Maybe they have leftover samples. Yeah, who knows? Yeah, that would be great. My, my, my uncle used to work at fiberglass up in uh, Santa Clara. He used to get the big chunks of aqua colored glass that before it was made into fiberglass. Uh, I, my sister still has a couple. Of them. They're beautiful. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. Oh, I found another picture here from the bicentennial. Let me pop this up here real quick. You know, you can still see the Renman's Winston sign down below, but uh, yeah, I mean, it was just a real shame, you know, that uh, this pavilion 10 years you know, later, 15 years later, was still in okay shape. We still hope to fix it. Yeah. Unfortunately, uh, did, not, uh, did not come to be. The other, the other photo, Bill, that you've posted, it's a, a startling photo. Someone, as they were building it, it's that enormous ladder that is kind of propped up from the ground to the, uh, to the, to the, uh, the edge of the, um, uh, the panels. And do you remember that one? It's a gigantic ladder. Yeah, I don't have that one, but I do have one right here of them building it. Let me pop that one up. So the pavilion in its happier days, all the scaffolding going up. But I do remember the picture that uh, Joey mentioned. I mean, this building was really tall and they found a ladder that went up almost to the roof of the building. And the thought of climbing up on that thing would be just scary as hell to me. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, yeah, you can see here that they're putting it all together. Uh, I've had a number of construction pictures of the uh, pavilion going up. and. Uh, I keep joking. I imagine owning the scaffolding contract for the 64 World's Fair. <laughs> it's just <laughs> monumental what they were, uh, you know, building together back then. And I just had one other one I was looking for real quick. My hang on. Here, uh, folks may get a kick out of this one. Uh, let's see here. We should, we've seen the pavilion in 64, we've seen the pavilion in 65, let's see it in 64 and a half. So <laughs> not, not too many pictures, chances you get to go and visit the, uh, uh, the, the fair during the, uh, uh, the winter, but this was one Albert Fisher took and it's a, a contingent of people going out and uh, exploring the fairgrounds to try to look what they were gonna do for Oklahoma and some other pavilions to uh, you know, update their uh, pavilions uh, between hand. So what's really nice is in this whole section of pictures, you have all these guys and they're all in their, you know, trench coats, top coats, whatever you want to call it. They're all marching around and all of a sudden they break out into a giant snowball fight. <laughs> it, it was like the World's Fair equivalent of a pie fight breaking out. So great, great fun. Question here: What are we going to do next week? I do not know. Uh, uh, I, I will uh, again always open to suggestions. Don has uh, very nicely volunteered. He's going to be taking us to Texas in 1936 coming up. Uh, uh, Chris, you and I have got to get together and we've got to figure out what works for your schedule at Hemisphere. And I've got to try to talk to the guy down in Australia. It's a terrible, terrible time lapse between him and us to try to talk about, uh, uh, you know, Expo 88, but I, I want to try to get that on, on the radar. So um, I don't know, um, I, I may come up with a common theme for next week, you know, uh, whether it's Canada at World's Fairs or 
Coca-Cola. I was thinking of actually Coca-Cola at World's Fairs, maybe, but uh, you know, um, or Coca-Cola at World's Fairs and theme parks. So I can go to the Disney parks too. So, but again, always open to suggestions and uh, appreciate everybody joining. Uh, again, if you do want to see uh, many things that have changed at this, particularly the 64 World's Fair, uh, go to the site worldsfairphotos.com. Go to the 64 page, take the virtual tour, and it's under miscellaneous photos. It's amazing to see how many things they changed over the years. You know, and entire pavilions come and go, but there's also just the little things like after a while you'd figure, why is anybody wor worrying about that sign? You know, I mean, just keep doing and changing it or whatever. So, but I think the US pavilion, uh, hopefully, you know, they are there in Dubai. Uh, you know, there were some comments in the chat about it. Uh, again, sponsored by uh, U.S. Uh, by uh, U.S. industry, the federal government has rejoined the BIE, which is a nice. first step, I think, in going in the right direction. Uh, you know, politics being the big thing, I, I do think it's important to make a, uh, a statement to the world on who we are, what we do, and what the people in the United States are all about, and a little bit less about Nikes and Coca-Cola and some of the others. And again, I don't mean to knock the companies. So if it wasn't for them, we wouldn't have been at the last uh, half a dozen World's Fairs at all. Randy? Maybe I'll, I'll, I know it's coming up two hours. Um, I'm not sure if you've done this or not. Uh, World's Fairs that were never held would be an interesting topic. Mm -hmm. You know, that mm -hmm. were planned. And, you know, there was the one in Long Beach, um, you know, uh, Expo 76 for the bicentennial, all those things. And, yeah, uh, I might, I might look into that. I, I still remember the worst uh, ill-fated idea of a World's Fair was the one that they were pr prompting out here for LA a couple of years ago. Yeah, I remember uh, that. Yeah, this was a concept. Uh, I remember I, I do the uh, bike patrol for the LAPD and we have this event called Cicla Via where you ride, shut down a city street and everybody comes out on bicycles, unicycles and everything. I go down the street and there's a booth there about support the upcoming World's Fair for, the, uh, for LA. And I said, oh, I got to stop and see this. So I go over there and their whole concept was, oh, uh, we're gonna put a World's Fair and we're gonna put a city, a pavilion in Glendale and a pavilion in Pasadena and a pavilion in Long Beach and a pavilion in Pacoima. And uh, cause it would, it would say, where would you put a World's Fair in LA? You know, what, what amount of empty land do you have for it? And the whole thing was, oh, each city would build its own pavilion and we'll link it together by mass transit. <laughs> and as soon as I saw it, I said, you guys are doomed, you're dead. I mean, you think about, Right now, if you look at the U.S. Pavilion for uh, uh, Expo 67, standing in line two and a half hours to go in and see it, that's great. But what if it took you two and a half hours just to get there? And you go to one pavilion and you wait two and a half hours to see it, and now you've got to drive two and a half hours to go wait two and a half hours, it just wouldn't work. So that's a, a great concept, Randy. I'll, I'll see what I can put together on uh, fairs that did not come to be. Yeah, you can also include uh, Minneapolis. Uh, was it Minneapolis? It was yeah, Minneapolis. Yeah. The third yeah. place for 2023. Yeah, we'll have to look at them. And Rome, Rome and Tokyo during, well, uh, just before the Second World War, both had big uh, plans. Yeah. Yeah, I need to run because I need to go see how the oven repair is going. But uh, Don, did you have something? Uh, well, two things, actually. One, and it's a question. We don't have to answer it now. Just put in a feel out there. There's somewhere there's film of that uh, moving grandstand inside the U.S. Pavilion in the New York World's Fair actually moving. It's a very short clip. I used to have it. I've gone through all my documentaries and I can't find it. So if someone ever knows where it is, I'd love to be told. Uh, I'd love to get it just, just out of curiosity. Uh, second, and uh, I don't know if you want to see the picture but there actually is in where I was yesterday in the Centennial Exposition, the uh, Federal Hall, they built a hall there too. And it's still fully intact. They just remodeled it. If you want 30 seconds, I can put a picture up or we'll just wait till later. We'll wait till you get there. Yeah, and I figured, yeah. getting late. But it's, it's, it was, I think every single branch of the federal government was in there. It's, it's, it's really a significant uh, thing, but we'll talk, we'll talk about it when I do the, the whole show. Great, thank you. Well, I appreciate everybody uh, doing it. Let's see. Oh, uh, Ferris wheels, Disney, Cracker Jacks. Yeah. <laughs> Get an air, air freight. Oh, oven. Yeah. Right now we're just uh, hoping we don't have to use a barbecue. So, <laughs> so, well, thanks again, everybody. Appreciate you joining us and we Thank will uh, look forward to seeing you next week. I'll put up a, a oh, air fryer. Okay. Uh, we will uh, put up the, uh, the schedule soon. So thanks all for coming.
Thanks, Bill. Great job. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Bye.